Hello, welcome to the Friday, June 9th, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Washington, D.C. Cisco patched a number of its products uh, this week. Now, among these patches, uh, there are two vulnerabilities that I found particularly interesting. Both of them affect uh, the Cisco Prime Data Center Network Manager. The first one actually bypasses authentication for uh, the system. Because Cisco by mistake left a debug tool enabled that does not require authentication. Exploitation should be pretty straightforward and may happen across the network. This vulnerability will allow an attacker to execute arbitrary command on the device as root. The second vulnerability is good old default static credentials. As you install this tool, a default account is created. The user is not informed about this default account and access to this account, again, across the network, could allow access to the administrative console of the device. According to Cisco, there are no workarounds, so get on patching. Given the simplicity of exploiting these vulnerabilities and the impact they may have, you also should make sure that there is no remote network access to this system. And talking about default accounts, ERP Scan did release a nice blog post listing all the default accounts that you commonly find in Oracle's PeopleSoft, including the passwords typically associated with these accounts. So great resource in case you need to audit Oracle's PeopleSoft. And well, uh, sticking with default passwords for yet another story, uh, F-Secure released a paper with details about vulnerabilities in OptiCam and FOSCam uh, digital video cameras. These are web-based network uh, cameras, and of course, they have caused a lot of pain for network administrators in the past. Yet again, default passwords, Telnet servers that are not documented, but enabled and give attackers access to the device using these default passwords. Of course, there are additional web application security vulnerabilities that you find in these devices. Also, vulnerabilities to the ONVIF interface. Uh, this is a fairly common standard interface that you find in network cameras. It's the Open Network Video Interface Forum. That's the what the abbreviation stands for. I think it's actually not uh, well probed and you will probably find a lot more vulnerabilities uh, being published in the near future regarding uh, this particular interface. Essentially it's a SOAP based uh, web service interface that allows you to integrate these video cameras with various uh, surveillance software solutions. And since it's a pretty well-established standard at this point, you'll probably find that many manufacturers implement it. And again, a user may not necessarily be aware of this particular web service being enabled. And Kaspersky is writing about a new piece of Android malware that they found in Google's Play Store. Now, what made this kind of malware a little bit different than other malware is, first of all, the attackers, the authors of the malware first uploaded a non-malicious version of the application, then briefly uploaded a malware version and then again replaced it back to the non-malicious version, kind of evading some of the security scripts that Google has set up to monitor the Google Play Store. Now, if you get affected by this particular malware, then what the malware does in addition to usual things like installing additional components is it actually patches system libraries in order to gain persistence on the system. According to Kaspersky, this technique has not been seen so far for Android malware. Of course, it certainly has been done for more desktop malware before. In the end, a system infected by this malware, you have a really hard time recovering it. Just deleting the malware itself, of course, is not going to do a good job in regaining control of the phone. 
It's Friday today and as every Friday for the last few weeks uh, we have another STI student. Uh, this time I got with me uh, John Dittmer. Uh, John, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, good morning. My name is John Dittmer. I'm, I'm a uh, MS in Information Security Management student at STI. So, uh, John, you wrote a paper that's actually quite intriguing about the uh, legal risks when using cybersecurity scanning tools. Typically, mm -hmm. when we cover these tools in class, there's always a disclaimer that you need permission first to use them. So the difference between hacking and uh, security scanning being permission in some ways. But your paper really also looks at a very other different aspect of cybersecurity scanning that, honestly, I haven't really been considering so much. Can you tell a little bit... Talk a little bit about uh, what this means or what the other legal aspects are of uh, using tools like this. Well, whenever you use a tool like this, you have to be careful. You have to get – first of all, you have to get written permission just like any other uh, form of, of scanning or conducting uh, information security operations. Um, there was a time where I uh, was working as a contractor for DISA, the Defense Information Security Agency. And we had to make sure that we had permission from the command that we were conducting scans on as part of the security inspection. We had to be very specific on what, for example, what IP addresses we were searching on, when we were doing the scanning, and how and what tools we were scanning on. So this way, um, people don't inadvertently think that we were actually hacking them. Now, in addition, uh, the results of the scan, like you know, if you are, for example, a very fine compliance uh, or... Uh, I think you have a real nice story at the beginning of the paper. There's sort of a security scan uh, of a system actually then uh, led to a legal case against an officer there. Uh, yes. Uh, sometimes people will – this is going back to getting that prior written permission um, because people will think that um, if – now also make sure that you – that. You follow the parameters of the scan that you, that has been agreed upon and consent has been given, because uh, too often, uh, what happened in that one case, it led to the officer being charged for for conducting for um, conducting a hacking campaign against a agency that he had worked for. Okay, now um, when you're trying to uh, verify, for example, a contract compliance uh, with a scan, like you're trying to make sure that a contractor implemented a certain security system actually um, did it correctly. Uh, so uh, could uh, your scan then actually sort of become evidence in a contract dispute? Yes, indeed, because it's actually verifiable um, evidence that the contractual obligations have been fulfilled. Now, any particular care you have to take that your scan is uh, done properly or so in order to uh, to use it in, in this case? Well, basically, you got to make sure, one, you have the written permission. Two, that you have a good recording and ver verification when you do your scanning. Make sure that you hit – you know, you have verifiable, verifiable proof that you're, you're fulfilling the parameters upon the agreed-upon uh, scan. Now, when you do a scan like this, uh, any particular care that you have to take as to what tools you use? Do they have to be commercial tools? Can it be open source tools or handwritten tools? Like, how do you make sure that uh, the tools are actually then, or the reports are then admissible? Well, first of all, you, pro you, you should do is run, if you have a lab, um, basically run your tools against known, um, uh, you can say, a known target. Like let's say you set up a, a computer lab where, okay, you know that there are um, known ports open, for example, or known vulnerabilities that you, you create. And then you, that would sort of like be a control experiment. And you make sure that when it scans, it actually shows that. And, and you kind of do a variety of targets. Like, okay, this is a known, you know, you create a known vulnerability. It shows up as that. It is, and, and make sure that it... It actually can be verified that you're hitting those control conditions before you actually go live with the scan. So what do you have to do it yourself? There are no sort of agreed upon standard tests or so that um, that you could use there. Um, not that I know of, but um, I, I didn't re re go in depth in that part of my research. 
Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of unfortunate. You know, when you're sort of talking about forensic tools or so that, and I think it's a little bit uh, part of the newness of the field uh, that uh, there aren't really any standards like this. Uh, and one thing I would probably advocate is that you know there should be more work done to do a verification, or perhaps maybe the um, there should be a standard where verification can be do done against. Mm. Yeah, some kind of standard NIST vulnerable system or something like that that uh, yes. could be used yet as a scanning target. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Now, um, what are you up to next, kind of, in your studies and any? Um, right now, I'm actually working on a paper on conducting patching, automated patching. Um, just to put a disclaimer, I work as a contractor for the DOD CIO. However, my views are representing myself as a as an STI student. One of the projects I'm working on is automating scanning throughout DOD. The the what makes it complex is that there's approximately seven million endpoints throughout DOD, um, and the way DOD works is it's a large, complex, federated uh, uh, collection of networks. So the problem is, is that sometimes we find out that vulnerabilities are found, even though there's been a patch sitting someplace uh, for months, even years. Uh, a good example was Heartbleed or Bash. Um, that was a vulnerability that was known for years. There was a patch available. However, in a lot of cases, that patch wasn't distributed to everyone. Where we're trying to, we're creating on is we're, we're at the pilot stage of automating that process so basically now this is a this is an, uh, an ideal goal and it'll be a long-term goal of automating patching all seven million endpoints within about um, within seven days of its release however that also include that also will add to that we we'll try to work where we can do um, advanced um, it, it, integration testing before the public release, but that that involves getting into contracts and agreements with the vendors. Wow, that sounds like an amazing project, and I hope that you'll be able to publish some of the work that you're doing there. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks, uh, John, uh, for joining us here, and uh, that's it for today. Thanks for listening, and talk to you again on Monday. Bye. All right. Thank you very much.